Prepare for a massive change in the stock market. The tides are dramatically changing, and the once dominant digital growth equities are losing ground to real economy stocks. The market environment has changed. Fundamental economy equities will perform better in the next 10 years than digital growth companies. Don't forget to subscribe to Wealth Dynamics to keep yourself updated with the latest happening and insights of the finance world. The Federal Reserve's aggressive rate hike cycle and the post-pandemic reopening have sparked a significant change in the leadership of the share market. The fastest-growing businesses have been hurt, as have those that prospered in the recent period of social alienation and during the shallow interest rate environment following the global financial crisis. Companies that generate more revenue from the real economy and give back more profits to investors have performed better. If history indicates anything, fundamental economy equities will continue to perform better than digital growth stocks for several years, if not the following decade. This new system is similar to the early 1980s investing climate. The Volcker shock, named after Federal Reserve Chair Paul Volcker, was a rise in interest rates to combat double-digit inflation that started a multi-year period of growth stock underperformance. Due to the rate shock, companies fundamentally altered how they distributed capital and set up their businesses. Furthermore brought on by it was the severe recession of 1981 to 1982. We notice some significant similarities to invariances from the current situation. Inflation is already declining, therefore, if the US economy were to enter a recession in 2023, it would probably not be as severe as the one in 1981 to 1982. Nonetheless, the interest rate shock of the previous year, brought on by the reopening of the economy and rising inflation, will have long-lasting impacts. We believe it will affect investor preferences and business decision-making, with management teams prioritizing profits over growth. The market's current focus shift from growth to the real economy is similar to previous market transitions. War, new technology, and shocks to the energy supply were a few of the elements that sparked them. There may be times during the entire economic cycle when stocks do well. For instance, the San P500's information technology sector has increased by around 9.5% annually. Although this is a significant gain, it is not the beginning of a new development cycle. The 2010s are where the most recent market change has its origins. While expected returns on physical capital were high throughout the decade, investment in it remained flat. This made sense. Investing strategies considered the rising value of digital, non-physical assets like software. However, the disparity between investments in physical and intangible assets was enormous in some instances. Investors' impression of the potential of cryptocurrencies, the metaverse, electric automobiles, and video conferencing led to an unprecedented disparity between the enterprise value of the business sector and its stock of physical assets. The situation of the American economy in 2021 is very similar to the late 1970s period that preceded the Volcker shock. In the actual economy, there is an insufficient supply and an excessive demand. The Fed 2022 responded with an aggressive tightening cycle, much like the Fed did in the early 1980s. It sought to control inflation by returning the supply and demand to equilibrium. The rise in interest rates in 2022 is the biggest since the Volcker shock. The IBM saga and the poor 1980s performance of IT. Stocks provide relevant comparisons to the current market regime change. As they do now, higher interest rates were a significant factor in the exodus of investors from growth equities, particularly the tech stars of the previous administration. Through the 1950s and 1960s, IBM stock outperformed the market by five times, reaching a high of six times in 1973. After that, IBM stock fell sharply in the market throughout the 1980s. Throughout the 1980s, IBM stock underperformed despite the business commercializing cutting-edge innovations. The IBM PC model 5150, the company's first personal computer, was introduced in 1981. Importantly, it was one of the first computers with an open architecture, allowing third parties to provide hardware and software compatible with the PC-5150. The development of IBM after the 1980s is also instructive. 
Louis Gerstner, a new CEO who came over in 1993, kept IBM together despite calls for dissolution. By the middle of the 1990s, IBM stock had once more outperformed during the dot-com boom. Under numerous corporate strategies and commercial settings throughout the ensuing decades, IBM fundamentally transformed into a reliable, cash-flow-generating firm. IBM is now considered a value stock. During the past 20 years, dividends have contributed more than 70% of the company's total return, against 20% for the IT industry. Is IBM's path to successfully serve as a model for some of the decade's most famous tech companies? That is what we anticipate. Due to rising borrowing rates, businesses are once again slashing expenses. Yet, unlike the 1980s, recent layoffs mainly affect higher wage workers, notably in the tech industry. Layoffs in this industry have often targeted unproductive divisions like Amazon's Alexa division or Meta's blockchain slash Libra division. Throughout the 1980s, American businesses increased their fixed assets even as they reduced their payrolls. Companies were pushed to invest in automation and other cutting-edge technologies due to pressure to reduce costs. Businesses have also adopted new conceptual frameworks like Six Sigma Data Analytics to streamline their supply chain operations. The goal of just-in-time production, which Japanese automakers pioneered and perfected, was to streamline and reduce the cost of a company's manufacturing process. After the US-Japan trade conflict of the 1980s, Japanese automakers built factories in the United States that used just-in-time production to evade tariffs on their auto exports. Their US rivals quickly adapted just-in-time output into their systems. Today, we can draw comparisons. We anticipate a considerable increase in physical investment in the 2020s, notwithstanding cost reductions and job cuts. Higher rates pave the way for a change in investor preferences, sparking company strategy and practice modifications. The change is most evident in the increase in shareholder value, which has become a new corporate dogma. CEOs are placing more emphasis on enhancing shareholder value by focusing on profitability and returns. High interest rates forced management teams to make their company's equity more competitive relative to bonds, even though they weren't the direct cause of the increase in shareholder value. Businesses increased their payouts. As a result, to entice investors to their shares. In the 1980s, dividends increased as a percentage of corporate profits and market capitalization. Further changes in investor preferences can be seen in the 1980s. Investors preferred value equities over growth stocks and sought out stocks with attractive dividend yields in the face of rising interest rates. There were new themes in investments. One of them is large box retail, which profited from corporate cost cutting, globalization, and automation and is led by rapidly expanding Walmart and Home Depot. The 1980 Motor Carrier Act deregulated the U.S. trucking business and helped big box stores. By increasing competition in the industry, this regulation significantly reduced the cost of transporting commodities across the United States. Companies that were able to benefit from the drop in shipping costs prospered. What does this entail for your portfolio, given the change in the market regime? First, if you are overloaded with growth stocks throughout the previous 10 years, your portfolio might not be in the best possible position to profit from the shift in market conditions. A natural economic cycle will incentivize investors to allocate capital toward addressing the requirements and stressors that have surfaced in various industries, even if it is still early. They include manufacturing, housing, infrastructure, and conventional and renewable energy. Investors may still favor businesses focusing on steady returns to shareholders over those promoting expansion at all costs. Management teams will renew the emphasis on profitability and return to shareholders. That is all for this video. We will be back soon with another informative video. Don't forget to like and share this video. Until next time.